it's a great uh, great pleasure to be here uh and the one thing i would wish is that after the presentation when you walk out and look at the stars and you can see them from here uh <laughs> that you will think maybe a similar talk is being given uh, near one of them, you know, and they talk about us in the same way that I'm, we'll be talking about them. So just think about it. Uh, and what I'll describe today uh, is partly the content of my book, Extraterrestrial. In fact, I have a new book that will come out in June 2023. So there will be some new stuff here that... Uh, you won't find in the book, but the cover of my book uh, is shown here in the middle. Um, and then I had another book, a textbook, that uh, also was based on exploration of life in the cosmos uh, that you can see here. And what you see on the left side is a photograph of a picture that was hung on the walls of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Arts and Sciences in uh, Germany and actually right now it's uh, also at MIT it's shown um, um, there and it, it was taken by a German photographer who came to my office and asked me to write on the palm of my hand the question that I regard as most important in science and I wrote are we alone and uh, by the way this is not a question that was borrowed from a dating site I had to I had to clarify that I gave a presentation um, in Las Vegas a week ago and uh, in the company of 800 women of the International uh, Women's Forum. And that was my first uh, statement, but it's actually a question for humanity. Okay, so that's the context. And uh, as it turns out, this question uh, has um, implications uh, that go well beyond science. and. I was really struck by the fact that I got an email from um, a rabbi, actually, uh, a couple of months ago. She said that uh, she wrote um, a word of Torah during the Jewish high holidays, inspired by my book. And so I wrote this uh, commentary in uh, Medium. You can check my commentaries. I write them every few days about um, why spirituality and the frontiers of science um, have some similarity. And the reason is that both of them explore the unknown. Okay, so that's very interesting. And what I'll describe today is a scientific project that uh, I established a year ago, and it's called the Galileo Project. And uh, what you see is a picture of uh, the members of the Galileo Project that came together uh, in August uh, for the first time in person after the pandemic. And celebrated the accomplishments of the project. So let me start with a short video from that uh, event. It's such a great privilege and pleasure to see 70 members of the Galileo project team coming together, celebrating the past year accomplishments of the project and uh, we are just at the beginning uh, because in the coming year we hope to collect data and find out what it shows. Uh, we, we make no assumptions, we are completely agnostic, but it seems like the government is telling us that there are some exciting objects out there that we need to figure out what they are. And that's our hope. For now, we assembled the relevant instruments, we are testing them, and we will soon deploy them and start collecting data. Because the sky is not classified, and we very much hope to discover what the nature of objects that the government is talking about, and that astronomers are talking about, that look like outliers are. Are they technological in origin from another planet? Or are they natural phenomena? And the Galileo project aims to find out along three tracks. One is looking at unidentified aerospace phenomena in the sky and uh, imaging them in the infrared, optical, radio, and audio bands. 
The second is rendezvousing with interstellar objects in space and taking a close look at them. It will cost about a billion dollars to meet an interstellar object. Uh, there is a much cheaper way of doing that, and that is to find an interstellar meteor. We know of one that landed near Papua New Guinea uh, in 2014, and we plan to search for the fragments from this meteor by scooping the ocean floor. And that is the third branch of the Galileo project. So we have very exciting times ahead, and we look forward to what we will find. So yeah, I'm Ezra. Um, had a great time on this project so far. We'll move on. Uh, and the, the fundamental question is, um, is there anything out there? And uh, what did the scientific method teach us so far? Well, the biggest message we get from the universe is a sense of modesty, a sense of humility, because um, the thing is, we now know that a substantial fraction of, the, of all the stars like the sun have a planet the size of the earth, roughly at the same separation. That fraction is somewhere between a few percent to a hundred percent. Uh, and therefore, there are more habitable planets like the Earth in the observable volume of the universe than there are grains of sand on all beaches on Earth. Billions of them in the Milky Way galaxy alone, and then you have trillions of galaxies like the Milky Way. And so when you see a painting um, of an emperor or a king that were very proud of themselves after conquering a small piece of land on earth, that doesn't look very impressive because it's just like an ant hugging a single grain of sand on the landscape of a huge beach. But I can understand where it's coming from. Uh, these are my two daughters when they were much younger, about two decades ago. And um, when they were young, they stayed at home and they thought that they're the center of the world, that they are the smartest uh, because they compare themselves to the family members. Uh, and of course, they had a psychological shock when they went on the first day to the kindergarten because they realized there is a smarter kid on the block, you know. And our civilization will mature when it meets others. This is a cartoon that was drawn when Albert Einstein died uh, and on the same day, and it shows the earth with a plaque on it saying, Albert Einstein lived here. So we are very proud of him, basically um, having the insight of on gravity, space and time and so forth. And my point is that Albert Einstein was probably not the smartest scientist who ever lived since the Big Bang. 13.8 billion years ago. There must have been smarter scientists on other planets, around other stars, billions of years ago, a long time ago, because the dice of intelligence was rolled billions of times. And what's the chance that we are the smartest? Not large. When on the first day at class uh, at Harvard, I tell the students in my class that half of them are below the median. Now, they, they get very upset, but that is the definition in statistics of the median. In any class, half of the students are below the median. That's how the median is defined. You can't avoid it. You cannot have everyone being the smartest, right? And so they get upset, but it's a statistical fact. And um, as far as I'm concerned, we are probably near the middle of the distribution of in, in intelligent civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy. That's why I think there must have been scientists smarter than Einstein elsewhere, and the civilizations who benefited from them could have launched probes that would have reached us by now. And the reason I say that is because most of the stars, like the sun, formed 10 billion years ago. And the sun formed only 4.6 billion years ago. So they formed a long time before the sun, 
And by the way, did you know that we have only a billion years left for us on Earth? Because within a billion years, the sun will boil off all the oceans on Earth. Irrespective of how well we preserve our climate, we would not be around anymore. None of the forms of life we see will uh, persist on the surface of Earth in a billion, a billion years. And, um, and therefore, if other stars form five billion years before the sun, most of the stars, then um, by now, they basically killed any civilization on habitable planets next to them. So these civilizations predated us by billions of years. And it takes half a billion years to traverse the entire Milky Way galaxy with chemical rockets, the type that we sent out. So they had plenty of time to reach us. They started, the clock of technology started earlier there than here. We are late bloomers. So how dare we even think <laughs> that we are the first, you know? And so my point is, we're currently developing artificial intelligence systems that will drive cars, that will handle our bank account, that, you know, anytime you Google something, you're in, interacting with an AI system. And in the future, we'll send AI systems to space. They are much better equipped to survive the long journey, to um, not be so, so sensitive to the energetic particles in space to the harsh conditions of space. They have the patience to travel for millions of years. Uh, humans will not survive that. We were selected by Darwinian evolution to survive on this rock that we call the earth. We would not survive in space. So, so AI astronauts are really the future and in interstellar space. And if we realize that someone else may have done that already. And so we should this is not a philosophical question that I'm asking whether there is something around us. We just need to look up. As trivial as it sounds, it's controversial to say that we should look up. Why is that controversial? Like, why, why should we close our eyes and argue with each other whether something exists out there? Well, the reason is simple. A lot of people prefer to maintain the idea that we are unique and special. And they better not go to the kindergarten. They, they prefer to stay at home and not look through the windows. So my point is we now have the instruments that can educate us about whether there are any probes or gadgets flying around that originated by advanced technological civilizations. And, and these instruments were developed only over the past decade. So they were not around before. So when people make the argument, why didn't anyone see it? It's because instruments were not good enough. So Enrico Fermi, for example, said, where is everybody? Well, he didn't, he just asked the question. He didn't develop telescopes to look out, just like someone sitting on the sofa at home and saying, I don't have neighbors. There is nobody sitting next to me. Well, guess what? To find your neighbors, you better look through your windows and you use a telescope to find them. And uh, of course, if you wait long enough, someone may knock on your door. But Fermi, you know, he just didn't wait very long. <laughs> and over the past decade, we found the first objects from outside the solar system. So we are really entering a new era and I get a lot of pushback from my colleagues who are not willing to entertain the possibility that some of these objects might be of technological origin. They argue that they, are, they must be rocks. But as we will see, the first one that was reported uh, was found by a, a telescope in Hawaii uh, in two October 2017. And it was given the name Oumuamua because it means a scout in the Hawaiian language. And this object was moving close to Earth, but too fast to be bound gravitationally to the sun. So they said, wow, this is the first object that came from outside the solar system. It's not bound to the sun. And they said, well, it's probably a rock from another star. But it was really unusual, and we will talk about it. 
didn't look like any space rock we had seen before. Turns out that four years earlier, there was another object that was identified from outside the solar system by the US government. The US government has missile warning system. It wants to know if there is a ballistic missile aimed at the US. So it monitors with a set of satellites that was actually established over the past decade only. And those satellites look down and search for objects entering the atmosphere. They want to figure out if in the old days, it was the Soviet Union. We now know that they don't perform very well. And so they're not as, as much of a risk as China. But nevertheless, you know, you want to know if someone is shooting a missile, ballistic missile at you. And every now and then they see an object entering the atmosphere, but they realize it came from space. It's not human made. And um, that's a meteor, a rock you know, a Lego piece from the construction project of the planets in the solar system. So there are lots of rocks in the solar system left over from the formation of the solar system. And every now and then the Earth collides with one of them. You can think of the Earth as a fishing net that uh, collects fish along its path as it moves around the sun. So when a rock collides with the Earth, it burns up in the atmosphere as a result of the friction with the air and you get an explosion. And if the rock is the size of a person, the amount of energy released in the explosion is as much as a nuclear, as the Hiroshima bomb, for example, a nuclear explosion. So anyway, there was this meteor, roughly half a meter in size, that uh, the government detected and reported about it in uh, a catalog of meteors and uh, just said it's moving at 45 kilometers per second. And it was discovered that uh, in 2014, on uh, January 8th. Now, I was interviewed in 2019, okay, five years later. There was a radio station in New York City saying, we want to ask you some questions about the meteor that just came along. And I said, okay, well, I'll read more about meteors because I, I was no expert on meteors. And then I came across this uh, catalog that the government compiled of meteors, and I told my student, check out this catalog because maybe there is an object there that moved so fast that it must have been unbound to the sun, an interstellar object. So he checked and we found it, this one. So we wrote a paper explaining, you know, the speed is so large. If we go back in time, it was unbound to the sun. Therefore, it's the first interstellar object four years before Oumuamua. Well, my colleagues, the referees of this paper said the paper should be rejected, not accepted for publication. Why? Because they don't believe the US government. And I say to myself, well, the US government needs to know if a ballistic missile will hit Boston or New York City. They have very precise data. But my, uh, the referees of this paper said, no, they don't know what they're doing. So, um, at the time, I was chair of the board on physics and astronomy of the National Academies, and I reached out to people behind the national security fence, and it took three years, and eventually this letter came out that you see here on the right from the Department of Defense, the U.S. Space Command. So basically, the Department of Defense came to our defense, and they wrote this letter saying that they confirm that given the uncertainties of the measurement, they could not release the uncertainties in order not to let adversaries know how well they measure things. But they said that at the 99.999%, this object indeed came from outside the solar system. And that was in March this year. They sent the letter to NASA and NASA took a month before they made it public after I asked them why don't they put it publicly and so they put it out and then uh, our paper got accepted for publication after that <laughs> so we decided to go ahead with an expedition to figure out what this, this object is because together with the u.s government letter there was also the light curve the amount of light emitted from this explosion um that was released and we could tell how much energy was released in the explosion so that allowed us to figure out 
the material strength of this object because it burned only 19 kilometers above the ocean surface. So we could tell that it was able to maintain its integrity down in the atmosphere to a point where it must have been extremely tough. It was tougher than iron. Uh, in fact, it was tougher than all other meteors in the catalog. So why would the first interstellar meteor be tougher than all the space rocks that come from the solar system? Maybe it's made of some alloy like stainless steel. So to figure it out, you know, it's not, again, not a philosophical question. We just need to collect the fragments and examine their composition. A kid can do that, okay, in principle. So we uh, <laughs> um, decided to um, plan an expedition, and I announced the expedition. And then um, within a few months, um, I had a Zoom call with a person who said, one and a half million dollars, no problem, you have it. So we're going in six months. And it turns out that a few months ago, we also identified the second interstellar meteor within the same catalog. And it's also very tough, tougher than iron. So the chance of drawing both interstellar meteors out of the population of space rocks in the solar system is less than one in 10,000. Whatever they are, even if they're natural in origin, they cannot be produced by a planetary system like the solar system. Maybe they originated from an exploding star, something else. But the point is, they might also be artificial in origin. They might be a spacecraft that just collided with Earth the way that the New Horizons spacecraft that we launched into interstellar space may one day, in a billion years from now, it will be uh, not functioning anymore, but it may collide with a planet somewhere. And let's hope that an astronomer on that planet will decide to have an expedition and examine what it's made of. My name is Avi Loeb, professor of science at Harvard University. In the coming months, I'm going to lead an expedition to Papua New Guinea to scoop the ocean floor and search for fragments from the first interstellar meteor. Although Avi is in search of what he believes may be alien technology, Proof of extraterrestrial existence has never been what's driven his life's work until now. I'm hopeful we will find something. The question is, what is it? An unusual rock, a natural object, or artificial? Despite being the longest serving chair of Harvard University's Department of Astronomy, it wasn't until recently that he started to investigate the possibility that there is life beyond our solar system. I found the catalog that the government compiled of meteors that were detected by government sensors uh, that are missile warning system. I asked my student to check if any of the meteors, the fastest moving meteors, could have arrived to Earth from outside the solar system. There was one in particular that sparked the interest of Loeb and his student, Amir Siraj. We decided to write a paper about this meteor, which was discovered on January 8th, 2014. Light from the explosion was seen by government sensors. Despite the government releasing limited data, he had discovered something groundbreaking. His paper laid out what he believed to be true. But three years after writing his findings, a major development confirmed what he knew all along. After a few years, the release of a letter from the U.S. Space Command in the Department of Defense stating explicitly that this meteor at the 99.999% confidence level came from outside the solar system. Based on the speed of the meteor and how much of the object burned upon entry, Avi determined that it must be made of a material that is tougher than iron. And so this one was an outlier in terms of its composition. It was also an outlier in terms of its speed outside the solar system. It moved at least twice as fast as stars move relative to the sun in the vicinity of the sun. Armed with new evidence validating his findings, Avi decided to take action and make moves to recover the object his next hurdle. Funding through private donations, he has secured a portion of the money to take the trip. Let's continue to look for objects like it. It was obvious to us that we need to go there and collect the fragments because to do the same thing for an object in space would cost more than a billion dollars. For a cost that is a thousand times lower, we can go to the ocean floor and collect material from an interstellar object. Now, 
Avi has the task of finding an object that most likely fractured on impact, leaving fragments possibly the size of pennies lost at the bottom of the ocean. It's a challenge that might seem insurmountable in the vast existence of the Pacific Ocean. But Avi is confident they will recover what they are in search of. It's a fishing expedition, literally speaking. And what we can do is basically take the trajectory of this meteor and extrapolate it all the way to the ocean surface. Now, of course, when the explosion took place, there were fragments generated and they were scattered over a region. One imagines that the tiny pellets would be carried farther away from the point of impact, whereas the heavier fragments will sink down closer to the impact. Finding a big chunk can inform us much more about the structure of the original object. We're planning to board the ship and build a sled and a magnet attached to it that will scoop the ocean floor and we will go back and forth like mowing the lawns across the region 10 kilometers in size and collect with a magnet all the fragments that are attracted to it and then brush them off and study their composition in the laboratory. This will be the first time that humans put their hands on the material that makes an object that came from another star. With more advanced technology in our skies than in any other point in history, new findings are becoming far more frequent and impossible to ignore. Thanks to a government report that was released last year, the possibility of extraterrestrial life and the pursuit of proof of its existence is finally losing its stigma. The stigma has been reduced. It would be the most important scientific discovery that humanity ever made, because if you think about it, it will change our perspective about our place in the universe. With science in his corner, this professor is not intimidated by critics. It's not a philosophical question whether we live in an environment where objects are floating around that are representing extraterrestrial technologies. We just need to use our telescopes and find out. In fact, we are not even the first to say that. Galileo Galilei said that four centuries ago, and he was put in house arrest. Today, he would have been canceled on social media. Once I realized that we found an object from a technological origin that was produced elsewhere, I would not seek approval from anyone else. I don't need likes on Twitter. I just want to know what it is. Okay, so this is the idea behind the expedition. And we have an excellent team and the best in the world. Some of the people that are very experienced in, in going to the ocean. And uh, as mentioned, we will use a sled with a magnet and um, go about 100 miles off the coast of Papua New Guinea. I have no fear of slipping on the deck of the boat. It will not be particularly convenient, but uh, for two weeks, it's worth the effort. And I spoke with the curator of the Museum of Modern Art. I said, if we find any gadget that is from another civilization, I'm happy to bring it to New York City to put it on display because it would represent modernity for us, even though it represents ancient history for the senders. So in answer to Enrico Fermi's question, where is everybody? You know, the, we should tell, we should say, um, perhaps knocking on our door. You know, the sound of the universe knocking on our door is what you just heard, the uh, seismometer signal from this meteor. And so, we're planning to do that. We have the funding. Now, let me go back. This object was roughly half a meter in size, but Oumuamua was much bigger. It didn't collide with the Earth. Oumuamua was discovered by the reflection of sunlight from it. So it had to be much bigger for us to see it. And it, it was roughly the size of a football field. But it had very strange properties. First of all, it originated in a special frame of reference called the local standard of rest, which is the frame that you get to when you average over the motions of all the stars in the vicinity of the sun. It's sort of like the local parking lot of the Milky Way galaxy. 
And only one in 500 stars is so much at rest in that frame as Oumuamua was. And you can think of the solar system like a giant ship bumping into a buoy that is at rest on the surface of the ocean. That was Oumuamua. And the sun gave it a kick as a result of its gravitational force. Now, as the object was tumbling every eight hours, the amount of sunlight that was reflected from it changed by a factor of 10. Um, and just think about a piece of paper tumbling in the wind. Uh, what you need to, to get so much variation is that it would be extremely thin so that the area that reflects sunlight changes by a factor of 10 as the object is tumbling. And so in fact, uh, the best fit to the variation of light was that of a flat object, pancake-like. And that's unusual for a rock. But what was more unusual is the, that the object exhibited an excess push away from the sun. And you can get such a push if the object evaporates. Um, in the case of a comet, you have a rock that is covered with the ice, and the ice evaporates when the comet comes close to the sun. However, there was no cometary tail in this case. In fact, the Spitzer Space Telescope looked very deeply around the Oumuamua and couldn't see any trace of carbon-based molecules, any dust or any gas. And you can see the image on the right side here. It basically is just noise. There was no cometary tail whatsoever. So the question is, what was pushing this object? And the only thing I could think of was that the reflection of sunlight is pushing it, radiation pressure. And for that, the object had to be very thin, just like a sail being pushed, um, except not as a result of wind, uh, but as a result of light bouncing off its surface. So that kind of a thin object that is nearly flat is not something that nature produces. So I suggested maybe it's technological in, in origin, like a light sail. And so that, of course, got a lot of pushback. The fundamental question is whether Oumuamua was artificial or natural in origin. And all of these anomalies made it an outlier. Now, of course, my colleagues argued it's probably a rock or a natural object. They said it quite decisively. But then some of them try to explain the anomalies because in science we have we don't have the luxury of ignoring evidence. You know that's the privilege of politicians. You know if you are in politics you can ignore evidence. In science you are not allowed to do that. So you have to explain it even if you argue yes it must be natural for sure it's natural it's a rock. You have to explain why was it pushed away from the sun without a cometary tail. So what did my colleagues suggest? They said, it's natural. Now let's think what kind of a natural object can do that. So they said, okay, well, maybe it's a dust bunny like you find at home, collection of dust particles that um, in a cloud that is very rarefied, very fluffy, a hundred times less dense than air. So when it reflects sunlight, it's so lightweight, like a feather, it gets pushed. The only problem with that idea, if it's a hundred times less dense than air, is that it would not maintain its integrity. Such a cloud, when it comes close to the sun and gets heated by hundreds of degrees. So, so then another team of astronomers said, okay, it's not um, a dust bunny, but maybe it is a hydrogen iceberg, a chunk of frozen hydrogen. And when the hydrogen evaporates, we can't see the cometary tail because hydrogen is transparent. Now, the problem with that, and we wrote a paper about it, is that it wouldn't survive the journey. Hydrogen evaporates very easily. So for millions of years, it would not survive the long journey through space. And therefore, it cannot really be from a very large distance. In fact, we've never seen a hydrogen iceberg. We don't know if nature makes it. Uh, we've never seen a dust bunny either. So then a third group said, well, maybe it's a nitrogen iceberg because we know that the surface of Pluto is made of nitrogen, solid nitrogen. 
So if you imagine planets like Pluto being everywhere, then maybe they get chipped off. The surface gets chipped off. And then we wrote a paper saying, okay, let's imagine that you chip off all the solid nitrogen in the Milky Way galaxy. There is not enough chips to explain a, a large enough population that of which one member is detected so close to Earth. So there is a problem with the mass budget. But irrespective, all of these explanations invoke something that we've never seen before. And my point is, if it's something we've never seen before, we better allow the possibility that it's artificial. It's simply common sense. But, you know, it's just like in politics, it's difficult to maintain common sense and go in the middle when there are people on both sides, on the extreme, um, that um, basically don't want to discuss it. So the scientists don't want to consider that possibility on the one hand, and then you have those people who want to believe it as if it is a religious experience. They want to believe it. I'm just trying to use the evidence we have and collect more evidence that will guide us, which is the scientific method in answering this question, whether Oumuamua was natural or artificial. And the way I think about it is like going on the beach. And most of the time you see rocks or seashells that were naturally produced. But every now and then you see a plastic bottle that tells you there is a civilization out there. So maybe Oumuamua was a plastic bottle. See, I'm, I'm a very simple-minded person. I am not, you know, trying to suggest things that we're not familiar with. Um, and the only way to find out is indeed to look out and, and get more evidence. And it turns out that three years uh, after Oumuamua was discovered, the same telescope in Hawaii saw another object in September 2020, which exhibited the same qualities. It was pushed away from the sun by reflecting sunlight and had no cometary tail. But a few weeks later, they realized, oh, this object actually came from Earth. It was a rocket booster that was launched by NASA in 1966 because they were, they were able to uh, identify that it was made of stainless steel based on the reflection of sunlight. So here is an object that was artificial in origin because we produced it. The question is, who produced Oumuamua? And these are the images of the rocket booster that was 2020 or so. So the way I understand the situation is um, imagine a cave dweller that is used to finding rocks and playing with rocks all of his life, coming across a cell phone. The cave dweller would argue the cell phone is a rock of a type that I've never seen before, which is true. I mean, it's an object of a type that you, he had never seen before. But if he's curious enough, he might press a button and realize it's not a rock. So what I really want is to press a button on an object like Oumuamua. That will solve the mystery. Turns out that this... Uh, Discovery of Oumuamua inspired a winery in uh, Santa Cruz, not far, um, to have this uh, special wine, the uh, Le Cigar Volant, uh, by the Bonnie Dune uh, Winery. And um, in fact, at the conference we had in August, uh, we ordered many bottles of this from the winery, and they had a press release about it. They were very proud of that. Um, here is another result of the discovery. Daily double. You are well in the lead at 4,400. How much would you like to wager? Let's do 2,000, please. Here's your clue. I look at the world and I notice it's turning, thanks to this man who studied at the University of Krakow in the 1490s. Who is Brahe? No, correct response, who is Nicholas Copernicus? You lose a little bit, pick again, Robin. Scientists for 600. 
We think of this Russian who became a professor of general chemistry in 1867 periodically. Robin. Who is Mendeleev? Yes. Scientist for 800. Avi Loeb thinks a space object seen in 2017 and artistically depicted here comes from this 16-letter type of being, the title of his book. Kevin. What is extraterrestrial? Correct. Uh, scientist for a thousand. Okay, uh, I stop here. Uh, um, now, it, it turns out that a year ago, uh, during the Jewish high holidays, uh, I also received uh, an email from another rabbi, uh, this time from um, Michigan, Ann Arbor. And um, he said that he gave a sermon about my book and actually shared it with me. And um, a colleague of mine said, next time we meet for dinner, my wife and I will ask you to give a sermon. To which uh, I replied, I would never lead a congregation whose members agree with me, you know. Um, so there is a new frontier in astronomy. These are interstellar objects, the first time over the past decade that we discovered objects from outside the solar system. And we can examine them. We can get more evidence, more objects, we can figure out their composition and, and ask whether they are artificial in origin. That's something new. Uh, there is also a new era in government. Um, the government is talking about objects they cannot identify. And in fact, there is a report, uh, the classified component of this report was delivered a couple of weeks ago by a new office in government that is collecting all the data about unidentified aerial phenomena. And actually the director of that office visited my home last month. Um, so the government has a lot of interesting data that is classified. And the reason it's classified is because it was collected by classified sensors. And the US government doesn't want adversaries to be aware of what sensors we are using. So therefore the data is classified, but it's data about the sky and the sky is not classified. So we can obtain new data using off the shelf instrumentation. And that's what the Galileo project is doing. And as I mentioned, just uh, imagine the new horizon spacecraft arriving to another planet. That would produce a meteor that would be of material strength quite different than rock. So the coming years will be quite exciting because we will get data and figure it out. And the Galileo project hopefully will be responsible for some of these insights. Now, um, you're all familiar with the Drake equation. That it's called after Frank Drake, who passed away in September this year. And it basically quantifies the likelihood of detecting a radio signal or a laser signal from another civilization far away. And uh, that's the method by which we search for 70 years since Frank Drake first pioneered this method. But that's just like waiting for a phone call at home. You may not get a phone call if nobody is around right now to send you that. Uh, the, the, the radio signals, if they were sent a billion years ago, they are now a billion light years away. They're not here. We cannot see them if the civilizations are not around. On the other hand, there is another method for finding evidence, and that is checking your mailbox. Because packages accumulate over time in the mailbox, uh, in the context of probes, the, if they are uh, propelled by chemical rockets, the speed that they move at is below the escape speed from the Milky Way galaxy. So they are bound gravitationally to the Milky Way galaxy. So the Milky Way galaxy is like a basket collecting all the probes, all the spacecraft that were launched over the past billions of years. We can look for them, even if the senders are not around anymore. And so instead of the Drake equation, the number of objects that we will find now is simply the number per unit volume times the volume of the survey. And there is another factor that we need to take into account. I call it the ostrich factor, and that's the likelihood that we will not look. So 
if we decide that we know the answer in advance, like many of my colleagues decided, that anything we see in the sky is natural and it must be rocks, we will never find it. If you're not expecting wonderful things, you will never discover them. We have the Perseverance rover on Mars. And you know, everyone is happy to consider the possibility that there was early life on Mars in the, forms of, in the form of microbes, because that doesn't threaten our ego. We know that we are superior relative to microbes, you know, so no problem if they find any evidence that there were microbes early on on Mars. But just imagine the same rover bumping into the wreckage of a piece of technology that we don't possess. That would be a blow to our ego. A lot of people would be upset by that. I see it as an opportunity because, you know, entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley can import those technologies. Anyway, um, what the Galileo project aims to do is rendezvous with the next Oumuamua. Go on a date with it. Because a picture is worth a thousand words. In my case, it's worth 66,000 words. I would much rather publish a photo album than write the book that I wrote. Um, you can tell from a photograph what the object is. Here is an image you can see here um, of, uh, that was taken by the OSIRIS-REx uh, spacecraft that landed on an asteroid called Bennu. And it will bring a sample from this asteroid back to Earth. And from this picture, you can tell that it's a rock. So if we land on an object like Oumuamua or come close to it, we can tell if it has screws, screws and bolts on it and a label saying made on exoplanet Y, or it's a dust bunny. In that case, we can't even land on it, or it's a nitrogen iceberg, a hydrogen iceberg. Again, I'm trying to say that a kid can tell what, the object is once we have good enough evidence and the way i see science is a way to maintain our childhood curiosity the wonder about the world we should not have a prejudice but just saying that i get a huge amount of pushback why do i need to get pushed i mean the biggest trauma that i had as a kid was sitting at the dinner table and asking a difficult question. And then the adults in the room would dismiss the question because they didn't know the answer. It was obvious to me as a kid, they don't know the answer. They don't want to discuss the question. And I thought that by becoming a scientist, I could follow the evidence, but deja vu, the same story again, now with my colleagues, not willing to look for new evidence to guide them. Why should we refuse? To collect that evidence. So it turns out we want to date the next Oumuamua. We have a dating app to do that. <laughs> so it's called the Vera Rubin Observatory that will start operations in a year in Chile. And most of the time, you know, this, this uh, telescope, I should say, has a camera which it has uh, 3.2 billion pixels. So your cell phone has a camera with a few million pixels. The camera of this telescope is a thousand times better resolution of the sky. A thousand times. 3.2 billion pixels. And this camera will take a video of the southern sky every four days. The entire southern sky every four days. So we could find more objects like Oumuamua. That's why I call it a dating app, because most of the time we will swipe to the left. Now, I mean, the young people in the audience probably know what I mean by that, but just to explain to people who don't use dating apps, swiping to the left means you don't want to, to date this particular partner. Okay, so most of the time we will not really date an object because it's very expensive. This date is a billion dollars, so we cannot really risk going after a rock, you know, like for that money. So we want to find unusual objects and just come close to them, take a close-up photograph and figure out what they are. 
Now we also have the Webb telescope and it's a million miles away from Earth. So if an object comes by, it would look at it from a different direction than the observatories on the surface of Earth. And if you ever wondered why you have two eyes, the reason is that with two eyes, when a threat comes along, like in the jungle, you have a tiger jumping at you, you can tell the distance, okay? So because you're seeing this object from two directions, you can estimate the distance. And that was important for survival. All the humans with one eye did not survive, the tiger ate them. <laughs> And those with two eyes were able to escape, in, uh, you know. So anyway, um, the Webb telescope is our second eye. And we could then figure out the three-dimensional trajectory of an object very precisely and tell whether it's uh, being propelled by some engine in addition to the force of gravity acting on it. And, you know, perhaps Oumuamua was flat and thin, not because it was a light sail, but because it was a leaflet from another civilization trying to tell us what to do to save ourselves to, for our salvation. And, you know, in that case, it would be tragic if, if we miss um, a love letter in our mailbox. Um, one thing that I see when I go to Harvard Yard at Harvard University is um, all kinds of statues and paintings of uh, past deans and presidents that wanted to preserve their physical appearance in some way. And as I said before, you know, within a billion years, the sun would erase all of these monuments. So um, it's not, and also they preserve just the physical appearance. So that's not really what these people were about. You want to preserve your guiding principles, your, your thoughts and so forth. And the best way to do that is to have an AI system that goes to interstellar space because it can outlast the sun for billions of years. And it can carry your blueprint, intellectual blueprint. It can achieve goals in interstellar space. So my point is that the best monuments are actually AI astronauts. Now, there is an embarrassing fact about the New Horizon spacecraft that we launched to Pluto because it had a small box attached to its surface that carried 30 grams of the ashes of Clyde Tambal. Now, these ashes are no different than the ashes of a cigarette. They carry no information. And if extraterrestrials find it, they would say, we want no business with humanity. They have this primitive ritual of burning the genetic information about a person that they want to commemorate. That makes no sense whatsoever because they cannot reconstruct Clyde Tambau from the ashes. If we wanted them to know about Clyde Tambau, we would send the stem, stem cell from his body. We would send his hair so that they can reconstruct the DNA. But instead, we sent these ashes. And I actually asked the principal investigator of this mission, why didn't you send a stem cell or some, you know, you could in principle have the electronic information about the DNA of Clyde Tambau and call it, in, you know, in a, on a hard drive or something. And he said that would have been a bureaucratic nightmare. It was much easier to send ashes. And I say in response that we should send another spacecraft that moves faster and apologizes for this box. You know? <laughs> anyway. Um, so the Pentagon reported about unidentified aerial phenomena. And we want to help the government. You know, that's our civil duty. We want to figure it out. The government is not a scientific organization. It's mostly interested in national security matters and the safety of mi military personnel. Um, so scientists should come to help. And in fact, um, Bill Nelson said that a year ago. So I... I sent uh, an email to the person under him responsible for science and said, I'm here to make your boss happy. And I didn't get a response. And so I established the Galileo project. We are doing it. Now, NASA, this summer, in response to my approach, they established a committee that will decide, that will advise them about how, to, how much money to allocate 
uh, to the study of these unidentified objects. And the conclusion will come out in next summer, in June 2023. The Galileo project is already doing that. We're funded by wealthy individuals that came to the porch of my home during the pandemic and were inspired by my book and gave me a few million dollars. There was no fundraising involved and no committee had to approve it. Um, so by now we have about 100 people involved in the Galileo project. We have about 800 that applied to be part of it. And so it's... It's going well, and we have actually this week is a historic week because it's the first time that all the instruments that we assembled are starting to collect data. And the data is transferred to a computer system that will analyze it. And there are two categories of objects. You can imagine objects that are natural in origin, like birds, insects, thunderstorms. Or you can imagine objects that were human made, like airplanes, drones satellites, weather balloons. The question is whether there is anything else. And the AI systems we will use will try to figure it out. So the coming weeks should be interesting because we are trying to get the system to work and then make copies of it. So to make enough copies so that we get to the bottom of the question that the government poses, we need the 10 times more funding. We need tens of millions of dollars, but we are hoping to, to get it. And in fact, yesterday I was at a summit in uh, Palm Springs and at the Palm Desert, and um, there were people interested in this. So my hope is we will get the funding we need without waiting for the committee from NASA. And this is an illustration of the first assembly of the instruments on the roof of the Harvard College Observatory. Uh, by now, they are placed in a different location. And they include a camera in the infrared, in the optical that covers the entire sky. So we are taking a video of the sky, an audio system, and also a radio sensor that covers the entire sky. Now, I don't know if you heard, but... Um, We've been looking at the universe for a century. And we know that most of the matter in the universe is of a type that we don't find in the solar system. So we call it dark matter to encapsulate our ignorance. For a hundred years, okay, so it's quite surprising that cosmologists who study the universe get paid because they talk about a substance that they don't understand. That's called dark matter. Now, to figure out what the dark matter is, we need experiments. Now, my colleagues always say about Oumuamua or other interstellar objects, they say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Therefore, we don't want to discuss a technological origin, even if the object is very unusual. And this is a statement made by Carl Sagan back in the 1970s. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Well, I replied to that, that extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. <laughs> and obviously, if you don't fund it, you will never see that extraordinary evidence, and you will keep arguing that there is no extraordinary evidence. Therefore, we shouldn't fund it, and therefore, you will never fund it, and you'll remain ignorant. That's one path that you can choose to stay ignorant. I don't want to take that path. Now, the Large Hadron Collider cost $10 billion. That's the largest accelerator that humanity ever built, smashing elementary particles and trying to find the dark matter. Okay, so when I started astrophysics, the most popular idea about dark matter was that it's a particle that represents a new symmetry in nature called supersymmetry. It's the lightest supersymmetric particle. And it was so popular that people decided to invest $10 billion in an accelerator, Large Hadron Collider. Now, the accelerator was built, performed fantastically well. Now, the only thing that was discovered is the Higgs boson for which the Nobel Prize was given, but that's old news. That's from the 1960s. Nothing really fundamentally new. 
there was no dark matter particle found. We invested $10 billion in that. So clearly, there was no extraordinary evidence for supersymmetry to justify it. Nevertheless, we spent $10 billion and didn't find it in the natural range of parameters that all the theorists argued. There were hundreds of papers, maybe thousands of papers, suggesting that it must be there, and we didn't find it. My point is we have intriguing evidence that interstellar objects are unusual, and at the cost of 1% of this budget, just $100 million, we can get to the bottom of the nature of these unidentified objects that the government is talking about. So the government cares about it, the public cares about it, but something is wrong with academia if we are not investing that money because it's not more risky than talking about supersymmetry. And in fact, I should say that in theoretical physics, there is a community which is the mainstream that was working for half a century, 50 years on extra dimensions, string theory, no shred of a clue or evidence to support that. So that's mainstream, hundreds of scientists holding hands together and saying, yes, this should be studied, but there is no evidence for it. So the argument that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence is clearly not adhered to in the mainstream of theoretical particle physics because the mainstream dominant component of that community was working for 50 years on extra dimensions that we have no idea about whether they exist. And they may, may be as relevant to the description of reality as the philosophical question of how many angels can dance on the head of a pin that many philosophers argued about. Now, of course, we can search for extraterrestrials you know, by other means. We can look for industrial pollution uh, on the in the atmospheres of other planets, you might think that this does not represent intelligence because pollution is bad. But in fact, if the planet is too cold, you can use pollution as a blanket that warms it up. And one can also search for artificial lights on the night side of a planet. There is a tension between the ability of a civilization to venture into space and its ability to destroy itself. As we know, when Putin is saying, I'm not bluffing when I am talking about using nuclear weapons, um, you know, that I was worried about that because um, I felt like a kid at home hearing the parents argue with each other and worrying about the neighbor hearing the loud shouts because the question is if we explode nuclear weapons in a nuclear war, the next world war, I was worried what will extraterrestrials think? They might downgrade our intelligence because we are embarking on a path for annihilation. That doesn't represent intelligence because, um, you know, in the context of natural selection, the fittest survives and the fittest will not engage in a nuclear war. So the answer to Fermi's paradox, where is everybody, could be that most of them are dead by now. But even in that case, we can search for equipment that was sent to space, and it could be either dysfunctional, like space trash, or it could be AI astronauts. And the thing is, it's very different. If we find a device in our backyard, it's very different than finding a radio signal that took 10,000 years to traverse the Milky Way galaxy to get to us because there is no urgency in responding to such a radio signal. But if you have an, a visitor in your backyard, you have to respond promptly. And we don't have a protocol. There is no organization that represents humanity. So it will be challenging. And even if there was an organization that represents humanity, you know, someone in the periphery would initiate something that could risk everyone else. Now, if you look at human history, what you often see is that a group of people, all the horrors are triggered by a group of people trying to feel superior relative to other people. 
And my hope is that by finding a smarter kid on our cosmic block, someone that is far more superior than all of us, that humans will realize that the differences among us are really not significant, that we should treat each other with respect as equal members of the human species. Because fundamentally, the cosmic play is not about us, because we know that we are not at the center of, of the stage. You know, in the old days, people thought we are at the center of the universe. We now know that's not the case. The earth moves around the sun, and the sun moves around the center of the Milky Way. Milky Way is not at the center of the universe. So that's known and also we know that we just came recently humans existed only for a few million years out of cosmic history which which is 13.8 billion years long since the big bang so if you arrive at the play at the end of the play and you are not at the center of the stage the play is not about you okay that's a, again i'm i'm just using common sense here and if you want to figure out what the play is about, you just look for other actors that were around for much longer. Maybe they know. Thank you. I'd be glad to take questions. How about, and now it works. How about one more round of applause for Dr. Avi Loeb? So we will squeeze as many questions as we can in. Friendly reminder before we do that, if you've enjoyed tonight's Global Summit presentation, show of hands how many have, I really did. Terrific. And again, take your hands and wave to those watching in Erie, Pennsylvania. Hello there, friends in Erie. Excellent. We will be at Esri tomorrow for Dr. Don Wright to explore the Mariana Trench and meet the challenges of Challenger Deep. We'll be right back here in this very room for Mr. Josh Friday on Wednesday. And then Thursday, we will be at the Hall of Letters, room 100 for our own Dr. Beher Gaucher from Erie, Pennsylvania. So we look forward to seeing you the rest of the week. If you enjoyed this and you think somebody else in your orbit will, grab your friend use your gravitational pull, bring them with you, and then we'll enjoy those programs. Now, you all did a terrific thing. You already showed me all of your hands. Those with questions, hands back up, and we're going to get to as many as we can. Derek, if you don't mind, you can swing around the back. I'll take the easy job and ask the person right here in the front row. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. It was really wonderful. Um, I have a question, though. Is it like uh, when you're going to uh, sweep the ocean floor for this uh, debris, um, what if it's not magnetic? Because many um, alloys aren't magnetic. So yeah, that's do you have other sensors and stuff going on with that? It's an excellent question. And um, for that purpose, we have a net that will go behind and collect fragments. Now, the question is, what's the size of the, uh, of the fragments? Because the space, uh, the holes in the net uh, should reflect that. And we just wrote a paper where we calculated and most fragments would be less than a millimeter in size. So that's the way we will design it. And of course, we'll do it by iterations. We'll have many nets and decide which one to use based on the experience there. And uh, the idea is that the uh, fragments from the meteor were quite different than the grains of sand on the ocean floor because um, basically what happened was when a meteor explodes, there is so much energy released, just like in an atomic explosion, that any solid object melts and you end up, if it's made of iron, for example, you, you end up with iron rain. If you were to use an umbrella, it wouldn't protect you because it's a molten iron making holes through them, unless you use a, an iron made umbrella. Um, so the point is these fragments settle to the ocean floor and the smallest fragments have a lot of friction with the air because they have a large area for their mass. So they slow down very quickly and they just fall down from where the explosion took place. So they are just, just like water droplets in, in the rain. They just fall straight down. The bigger fragments continue along the path of the meteor. So, they, so what you end up with is a strip where at the beginning of the strip, there are the small fragments and then bigger and bigger as you move along. 
And we want to find that strip and just collect it. Yeah, within. Uh, by the way, the, uh, the US government, we asked them and they're working on it. Really, I, I do find it quite surprising and, and rewarding that you know, people in government are behaving as our allies. They support us, they want us to succeed. And we went through the White House, we went through um, the Department of Defense and they're really trying to help us. And all I see from the academic community is hostility. They say, why should we do that? And I say, you know, this is, I'm not taking funds from any existing scientific project. These are private donations that were given to us to pursue it because people are inspired by the mission. And so the public, now when you have committees that are allocating federal funds that are populated by mainstream scientists, they often argue, we shouldn't take risks because we're using taxpayers' money. So we should not waste the tax. Now, guess what? If you were to ask the taxpayers, they will tell you that this is a more exciting subject than the search for dark matter. So I'm saying to reflect the public's interest, you better fund it, but there is no money funding it. And I'm getting my money that was never allocated to science to do this. And nevertheless, you find scientists that complain about the mission. Now I ask what, what is the problem here? Like, we're just trying to figure out the composition of an unusual object, even if it's natural. Based on the fact that the material strength was tougher than iron, we will probably find something new about where, you know, the birth sites of such uh, objects and learn something new in astrophysics. So it's a win-win proposition. Anyway, I, I just, once again, I'm using common sense and I don't understand my colleagues. That's it. Maybe. Okay. Um, so, with like the size of the universe, like the the two main things that I can remember from other stuff talking about, um, you know, like alien life and the probability of finding it. Oh, okay. Um, was there was uh, two main factors, like the likelihood of life forming on a planet, which is, you know, we don't technically know it yet. So, you know, how much. Uh, debris we find from other worlds would be very interesting to show how likely the formation of life is just in general. Um, and then also... So what's the question? I know. Oh, right. I know. Um, and then the speed of light is also, you know, very great and kind of poses a speed limit. So, um, yeah, it's basically how does the large distances between unknown amounts of civilizations kind of factor into the search for life. Yeah, so as I said, it takes less than, it's about a half a billion years. If you use the rockets that we launched, we launched five probes into interstellar space. It was Voyager 1, Voyager 2, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, and New Horizons, five in 50 years. We launched them. They're making their way to interstellar space. We launched them only decades ago. It will take them tens of thousands of years to leave the solar system, but they're on their way, okay? Now, the age of the Milky Way galaxy is more than 10 billion years. So tens of thousands of years is nothing relative to that, okay? Now you ask, how long does it take it to cross the entire Milky Way with the chemical propulsion, given the speed that we gave those probes? It's half a billion years, which is still a factor of 20 shorter than the age of the Milky Way. So what I'm saying is most stars from billions of years before the sun, if there were civilizations that sent equipment at a very low speed, the speed of chemical rockets, which is 1% of 1% of the speed of light, nothing to do with the speed of light, 10 to the minus four, okay? One part in 10,000 of the speed of light, very slow moving rockets, they can make the trip in half a billion years, meaning that all these stars that formed five billion years before the sun had enough time to traverse the Milky Way galaxy many times over, okay? And if you build probes that can self-replicate the way biological systems do, if it's equipped with a 3D printer, then when it lands on a rocky planet, maybe it produces more copies of itself, then you can exponentially increase the population of such things. 
you land on, an, on, on, a, on a planet and then you produce more of the same, just like biology works. Um, and then you could have the entire Milky Way galaxy full of probes. And so the only question is, are we living in such a reality? The speed of light has nothing to do with it. Are there lots of probes around us? Because there was plenty of time to traverse that distance. Now, of course, the distance to other galaxies far away across the entire universe will never be traversed. But who cares? There are, there are billions of habitable planets in the Milky Way alone. Okay. So the only question is, are they around us, these probes? And my point is, let's find out by looking up. Let's not argue about it. It's not you know, it's not something we should discuss on social media. It's a waste of time to argue, yes, I know the answer. It's this or that. And I get a lot of likes for that. Therefore, it must, that, that's completely irrelevant. You know, I have no footprint on social media. I don't care what other people say. I just want a photo album of objects like Oumuamua. You know, just look at it and you will tell. Is it a hydrogen iceberg, a nitrogen iceberg, a dust bunny, or some relic from another civilization. Let's find out. And it's not too complicated. Why should we argue ahead of time? And it's not so expensive. We can do it. We have the instruments to do it. And now we're entering a new phase where, you know, it's all possible. It wasn't possible more than a decade ago. So let's do it. Dr. Loeb, over here, we have a question. Okay, go ahead. Dr. Loeb, after reading so many articles, it's a real pleasure to see and hear you in person. My question is, was there enough observational evidence of the trajectory of Oumuamua to trace it back to its origin or its exit route as it left the solar system? Um, sorry, was there? Okay, thank you. Trace it to its origin. So the thing about its origin is that it came from this uh, special frame of reference, as I mentioned, the local standard of rest. And you may ask yourself, What's special about that frame of reference? What's special about it is only one in 500 stars is at rest in that frame, okay, as much as Oumuamua was. So therefore, you cannot trace it to any star because just imagine a car in a parking lot at a city. You cannot tell which house it came from. If the car was moving from the house in a straight line, you could find it. The other point to make, I mean, so, so maybe, the putting it in the local standard of rest is a way of hiding its origin. Um, but another thing to keep in mind is the extent of the solar system goes halfway to the nearest star. It's called the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud goes halfway to the nearest star, Proxima Centauri. So just think about the nearest star having an Oort cloud. So basically, it's like um, billiard balls densely packed, you know, like. The Oort cloud of the nearest star is touching the, our Oort cloud and so forth. So if an object came to us from another Oort cloud, we'll never figure out from where because just like a set of densely packed spheres, but any line of sight crosses many of them. So you wouldn't know you wouldn't, unless you knew at what time it was sent. So we will, I mean, of course, uh, that didn't prevent many scientists to suggest that they know where it came from. But I'm, I'm explaining why it makes no sense to talk about. So I know there are more questions, but we are officially out of time, which just means we're going to have to bring Dr. Avilo back to Global Summit 2 here at Redlands next year. I'm going to ask you for a round of applause for Dr. Avilo. Yeah.